Good morning, Skybridge. Good morning. Good morning, beautiful people of Skybridge. Let's stand to our feet all over this great San Antonio right now. In your homes everywhere outside of San Antonio, welcome to our worship service this morning. God is good and worthy to be praised. You know, each and every day we thank God for just being with us. So many things continue to happen in this world. We lost another young man uh, to injustice. We want to pray and lift that family up even now, dear Father God. And we want to pray for to calm our nation, calm our cities. Uh, Lord, we need you to be in the midst of everything, even right now. We thank you for who you are and whose we are. So, Lord, we need you this morning. We need you this day. We need you this hour. So, Lord, we ask that you just touch our hearts even right now, dear Father God. So much injustice that is happening in this world to your people. Scripture tells us in Isaiah 63, 7 and 9, it says, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord, and I will praise of the Lord. According to all the Lord has bestowed on us, and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindness. For he says, Surely. They are my people, children who will not lie. So he became their savior, and all their affliction, he was, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and his pity, he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days old. Let us go in prayer. Our Father, all-powerful, just in all your ways. All things are yours to give, supremely and untainted. Today, Lord, we recall your loving kindness. Thank you that you walk with us every day, that you are with us each moment. Each moment that we're going through right now with this COVID-19, the moment of injustices all around this nation where we're losing our black men, black women, sisters and sons, husbands and mothers. Lord, we ask that you calm the hearts of those people that will bring harm to your people. Lord, we need you now even more than we have needed you in the past. And we needed you in the past just as much. So, Lord, we thank you that your promises are true and your goodness never fails us. At this moment, we come to you and we lay our lives before you. May we worship and adore you with every passion of our being. May everything within us cry out because you are our Savior through your strength and your power, who was, is, and is to come. And so today we join with all those who worship and confess you as Lord here at Skybridge and on Facebook Live. Help us right now, dear Father God, with the angels that sing in heaven of your greatness and your faithfulness, that the Lord we love and honor you, and that you are precious to us. So help us, dear Father God, as we move forward in this day of worship. Give us strength, give us guidance, give us understanding on our purpose, what we need to do to help through you calm this nation. Lord, as ask our angel of the house, your preacher, will pass forth your word today, dear Father God. We ask that his, the word that you give him will be chewed up and nourished by those that will hear his word today through you. Lord, we love you. Give us strength. Give us encouragement, dear Father God. Lord, as we move forward right now, dear Father God, we just ask you to 
meet us at the point of our needs to Heavenly Father. If it's health, if it's injustices, if it's homelessness, if it's children, if it's parents, whatever it is, just Father God, we need you right now. Calm our nation. Heal this land. Continue to give us mercy. We love you and we thank you for your mighty son, Jesus Christ, who went on the cross to die for each and every one of us that we can have everlasting life. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 God is in control. Isn't that good news? He's on the throne. He reigns over everything and everybody. And so because of that, we can find peace today. We can find calm today because he reigns over all. Amen?
And because he reigns, we can rejoice. We can rejoice because he reigns. He's in control. He is our God. So let's praise him this morning. Amen. Let's praise him. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord, come bless the Lord, draw near to worship, Christ the Lord, and bless his name, his holy name, declaring he is good. Come bless the Lord, come bless the Lord, draw near to worship, Christ the Lord, and bless his name, his holy name, declaring he is good.
even the sound equipment rejoiced on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God is good. And in spite of everything that we have going on, in spite of everything that we're seeing in the news, in spite of the injustice, in spite of our people dying, our people being afraid, our people being angry, and then you add to that COVID, and then you add to that natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of reasons for you to be discouraged. But I want you to know today that you can be grateful because as you look back over your life, you can see God's handprint and how he brought you through times like this before. And if he's done it before, he will do it again. So I want to encourage you to be grateful. I want to encourage you to be thankful. I want to encourage you to still walk in faith and not by sight because God is faithful. Don't be like Peter and step out on the water and begin to walk and then look around at your circumstances and because you see your circumstances, you begin to sink. Don't do that. Keep your eyes on him. Keep praising him. Keep praying to him. Keep your faith in him and be grateful. And I guarantee you victory will come. I guarantee you he will show up and show out. Because he is our God. And he loves us. Amen. Amen. I am grateful for the things that you have done. Yes, I'm grateful for the victories we won. I could go on and on and on about your words. Because I'm grateful, grateful, so grateful just to praise you, Lord. That you have done. Yes, I'm so grateful for the victories we won. Hallelujah. I could go on and on and on and on and on about your words. Because I'm grateful, grateful, so grateful. 
faithful just to praise you, Lord. Flowing from my heart, my heart, my heart, my heart are the issues of my heart. Ooh, it's gratefulness. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. Hallelujah. Ooh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I am grateful for the things that you have done. Yes, I'm grateful for the victories we won. I could go on and on and on about your works because I'm grateful, grateful, so grateful just to praise you, Lord, flowing from my heart are the issues of my heart. It's gratefulness. We're going to sing it one. Help us worship, I'm worship, so worship, worship. I am grateful for the things that you have done. Yes, I'm grateful for the victories we won. I could go on and on. So grateful just to praise you, Lord. Flowing from my heart are the issues of my heart. It's gratefulness.
even in the midst. come to your throne of grace on another Sunday morning, and in particular as we open up the scripture, your words to our ears, we pray, O oh God, that you may open our eyes that we may see you clearer, open our ears that we may hear you better, open our hearts that we may be receptive to this gospel message, that when we leave this place today, we will be a better people than we walked in. Lord, we thank you now for the worship that is going forward, the, the praise on the lips of the saints. We thank you for those who are in attendance through streaming, both here in San Antonio and around the world. I pray that even after this message is preached, that it will continue to be preached. Days, weeks, and maybe even years after we are gone off the scene, that you may receive glory and praise and scripture will be clarified and hearts will be changed so much that you get all the glory and praise in the name of Jesus the Christ our risen Savior, our Lord and our King soon to come thank you God for who you are thank you for making a way out of nowhere thank you for bringing us through some dark times right now Lord for if it hadn't been for you on our side, where would we be? But thanks be unto God that we are here today and we have the opportunity to share the power, the gospel message concerning Jesus the Christ. We love you, O oh God, and we thank you in anticipation of what you're going to do today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Meet me, if you will, in the book of John, chapter number four. John, chapter four. There is a word for us today that I believe that is relevant to a time like this. Actually, just the first uh, four verses. First four verses of John, chapter four. I'll be reading from the ESV version, and if you have another one, uh, read along and go back and reread this after we are done and see if God won't bless you real good uh, from the John chapter number four. It says this, 
Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making disciples and, and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. Verse number four. And he had to pass through Samaria. I like the old uh, King James version that says, Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. There is a, a double positive there. I must, I need to go through Samaria. There's something happening in Samaria in this time, in this day. We have our own Samaria that we must need to go through. I'm here with this today from the topic, the church must go Samaria. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, the church must go through Samaria. Thank you so much as you take your seats. Good morning, Sky Bridge and those who are worshiping with us and streaming on this morning. I'm, my heart is heavy in the midst of all the turmoil because of racial unrest in the United States and demonstrations across our land and around the world. We have people protesting that Black Lives Matter in Toronto, Canada. In Iran, of all places, in the United Kingdom, uh, so many countries have picked up this banner because we come to find out that lives are being discriminated against in every country in the world. We're not unique. It, 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 it is important for us in the United States of America. We're so tired of saying that black lives matter, and then people want to protest against that saying and say all lives matter. We're not saying that all lives don't matter. We're just saying that you act as though black lives don't matter. I'm reminded in the operating room several years ago when I was still working there at the UT Health Science Center, and we were talking, and some people say, I don't go to the Spurs game at the AT&T Center at the arena there because the center is located on that side of town. And uh, I, I don't go any further than Loop 1604. In other words, from 1604 and north is where I live and I stay. And so some people were saying, I don't go there because the AT&T Center is over there. The implication was over there are some people I don't deal with, some people who don't look like me over there, some people near the AT&T Center that don't shop where I shop, that don't hang out where I hang out, don't c c commune with people that I commune with. I don't go to the Spurs games because it's over there. There is a short hush in the room. And I spoke up and I said, interesting, I grew up over there by the AT&T Center. That's where I grew up and that's where my family still lives. You could have heard a pin drop. I, I think people have grown to think that as long as there is one African-American man in the operating room, I can deal with him. I just don't want to deal with all of them over by the AT&T Center. See, the idea was they are thinking they're in a safe place to say what they want to say, that over there, but you don't understand it, there are different people with different points of view, and they're still just people. We never interact with some people and other races and other ethnicities. We, we shun them, and by doing so, we stunt our own social and cultural and religious growth. And we miss out on different foods, dance, sports activities, points of view, and different life experiences because we don't go over there. Over there is their Samaria. Over there. 
Samaria represents a land that we don't go to or go through because it's them over there. That's the text today. I'm not making this up. It's right there, and you can read it for yourself. The Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans over there because they are over there. Heaven forbid if back in the day, Minister Hardiman, if the AT&T Center had been built in Samaria, there would be a lot of Jews not going to an NBA game because it was over there. Uh, they didn't want to go over there. We become afraid, listen to me, uh, and uncomfortable with people who do not share our traditions, our local vernacular, our sense of humor, our music, and even our joys and our sorrows. And they don't understand why if a man is killed in Charlotte, a black man in San Antonio hurts. You hurt and kill a man in Colorado, a black man in Washington hurts because of a collective understanding that the Bible was written primarily in an Eastern and Middle Eastern culture that believed in uh, collectivism or collective worth and youth and, 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 and responsibility. We worked together. We brought in this idea of individualism from a Western point of view. It's more of a European view that we've adopted in the United States. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. That's not how the Bible teaches it. The Bible teaches it that we ought to care for one another. It, there's, sense, there, there's a sense in the Bible of unity and collective growth and collecti collective living together. Right now, we are at a pivotal point in our nation's history here in June of 2020 when we are experiencing a viral pandemic that is making us have to sit down and notice people who live in Samaria over there. We are experiencing extreme political division between one party and the other. Police are executing black citizens in the streets with a license to kill. And our politicians refuse to act and give us a remedy for the situation, although that's why we elected them, so they can fix issues. And yet they bury their head in the sand as though nothing is going on. I remember when children were shot and killed at a school, and we tried to get reform done for guns. And they put the camera and microphones on some of our senators who were supposed to represent the people and some of our congressmen and women who were supposed to represent the people. And the answer they gave us is, this is not the time. Wait a minute. If our people are being killed in the street, and if you decide you don't want to deal with that, let's then turn our attention to our children. And our children are being killed in their elementary schools, their middle schools, and their high schools. Then we turn the cameras back to you leaders, and we ask you for some solutions, and you say, now is not the time. If not now, then when? And if you can't get the job done, then we need to put somebody in who can get the job done. I'm telling you, the church must go through Samaria. I'm tired. I'm tired of when our bad police take out our citizens and we refuse to bring an indictment against those cops. And even when we take it to a grand jury and there are film and there's evidence, the grand jury comes back with a statement and says, we can't find enough data, enough information, enough proof 
to bring evidence. Even if you do bring it to court, every court says not guilty in every situation. Our courts refuse to arrest them and bring the bad cops to justice. Somebody once told me if you have 10 bad cops and 1,000 good cops, but the 1,000 good cops refuse to speak up against the 10 bad cops, then you actually have 1,010 bad cops. Somebody needs to speak up. I'm telling you, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm tired, I'm fed up. And we're tired of being killed and nobody comes to our rescue. You wonder why. Sometimes our policemen wonder why when they show up at the scene of a crime in an African-American community. And the African-American community refused to tell them who uh, uh, the perpetrators were. Because we know that you're going to, you're going to treat the perpetrators in the African American community harsher than you will treat the whites in the white community. As a matter of fact, when there are police issues in Alamo Heights and some of our more uh, considered more upper class, richer, more affluent neighborhoods, we don't hear about police issues over there, but they happen, but we keep it quiet. We don't send the television stations over there, but it's happening. I know because we have people that we know that tell us about the issues, but it don't make the news. But let it happen into a Hispanic neighborhood or a black neighborhood. And then there you are with the camera saying, on this side of town in Samaria. I'm tired of you just coming to Samaria. It's happening everywhere. Our citizens feel angry. We're fed up. We're exhausted. Those people who sworn to protect and serve are the very ones oftentimes abusing and taking lives. I tell you, it's time for the church to go to Samaria. Our nation, our government of the people, by the people, and for the people as a declaration from Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address, has decided after careless and senseless murders of Ahmaud Arbery in Georgia, Breonna Taylor, an EMT who goes out and helps save lives, EMT in Louisville, Kentucky, shot in her own bed, now shot black while sleeping, and George, and George Floyd in Minneapolis, enough is enough. This is the time for the quiet, passive, comfortable believers of Jesus Christ to not merely preach the gospel, but to live it out in our daily lives. I'm telling you, it's time for the church to go through ah, Samaria. Yes. Let's have a unified worship service. That's nice, but that's just the start. The, the gospel saves lives. I understand that we can't legislate the heart. It's, it's Jesus Christ who changes the heart. Justification. But it's those of us who know better. We have Genesis through Revelation, and we sit on our hands as though we've never heard of Jesus, and we refuse to go to Samaria. We are part of the problem. We have been justified through Jesus Christ. And now, the, let me tell you this, justification is free. And justification means that God did all the work. He called us, redeemed us, saved us, and adopted us into his family. And now, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have the responsibility to not just pat ourselves on the back and be happy that we are redeemed, but we have to go and do the hard work that Jesus did. 
I'm telling you, it's time for the church to go through Samaria because now we are in a place called sanctification. That means growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Sanctification requires going. Sanctification requires doing. It's not enough just to have a worship service. We got to leave the worship service and go out in the community and do like Jesus went out and did. James says it best in James chapter 2. He said, faith without works is a dead faith. In other words, if the faith that you say that you have doesn't move you to do something against social injustice, against the poor, against the widows, against the orphans, and against those who have no voice, then it's a dead faith. I tell you, the church must go through Samaria. I appreciate when you call my preacher friends and Christian friends who says, Russell, our thoughts and prayers are with you in the African-American community. I appreciate that. I really do. But after your thoughts and prayers, we need action. I don't need just your thoughts and prayers. No, don't get me wrong. Prayers and your thoughts are appreciated, and prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ changes things. But it ought to change you, too, and make you uncomfortable to only issue thoughts and prayers. I, I, I went and we marched, me and my son, we walked with people in the Black Lives Matter march a couple of weeks ago. And, and people came to me and showed me the doctrine of what Black Lives Matter movement means. And there's a lot of stuff in the Black Lives Matter movement that I don't agree with. I'm not talking about their doctrine. I'm talking about what they're doing. They're doing something that the church ain't doing. The church is sitting back and rather than criticizing the doctrine and sitting in our pews and sitting and hiding behind our pulpits, we're doing nothing. At least the world is marching. What are we doing? D give me your thoughts and prayers. I appreciate it. But after that, we must push for change. Even at the expense of civil disobedience, you say, wait a minute, Reverend, wait, 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 ah, pump the brakes, Reverend. You're getting ahead of yourself now. You know, you, you're talking about, you talking about, uh, we saw some, I'm not saying go and vi violate the law in the sense of uh, breaking into glass windows and kicking in businesses and starting fires. I'm saying civil disobedience according to Scripture. In the book of Acts chapter 5, uh, uh, when, when the apostles were told, shut up, stop teaching that Jesus stuff. Uh, Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. That's civil disobedience. In other words, we're, we know we're called to obey authority, government, because God ordained government. But when government has put its knees on the neck of humankind, then it's time for us to rear up and say, I will follow God instead of the police. I'll follow God. Instead of our congressman, I'll follow God at the expense of civil disobedience rather than men. Right now, everyone is looking to the church for biblical solutions. Right now, the church is being judged on how we care for one another, how we speak up for one another. I'm tired. For some churches and some pastors only lifting up abortion and saying, we are speaking for those who have no voice for the babies. Actually, you don't mind speaking up for the baby because the baby don't vote. But let the baby grow up and become a black man and then you shoot him. And now, where is it that you're speaking up for life? We need to speak up for life at every level of life. When they're babies, when they're teens, and when they're grown. And when they're old, don't just speak up for the unborn. Speak up for those who are born. We'll be judged by how we care for each other. The poor, 
those who have no voice, those who cry out, I can't breathe. We don't merely uh, uh, want another worship service. We can't remain comfortable in our pulpits, our gated communities, drinking our lattes, and only traveling within a small radius uh, in our suburbs. We can no longer ignore the plight of the hurting, uh, the needs of the inner city, the underserved, and the overlooked. We must become uncomfortable, church. We must become uneasy going over there to Samaria. Listen, we don't send well people to the hospital. We send sick people to the hospital. And when the sick people can't get to the hospital, guess what? We have a system called EMS, Emergency Medical Services, that go to where the sick people are and go and get them. The church is the EMS of the world. But we don't want to go to Samaria. We don't want to go over there and pick them up. 1 John 3, 17 says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? It's time for the church to go through Samaria. In this context, Jesus is on a 70-mile track from Judea back to Galilee. And in between the two regions is an area called Samaria. Normally... The trout is, the route is you go from Judea, and when you get to Samaria, Sister Beverly, you make an eastern route. You, you go out, it's, let me say it like this. I'm going from San Antonio to Austin, but I don't want to go through San Marcos and New Braunfels. So I'll go all the way around Seguin, and come back up into Austin, because I don't want to deal with those people in New Braunfels, D. I don't want to deal with them people in San Marcos. So I'm going to go around. I'm going to take an extra long track, Sister Benita. I don't, I don't want to deal with them college students up there. I, I, I don't want to deal with them, so I'm going to go around. Jesus says, I must needs go through New Braunfels and San Marcos. Uh, uh, he says, I must deal with the people that everybody else go around. We're too good to go through there with them people. Uh, we're, we're, but we're missing out on some stuff that they got and that they need. In Samaria, uh, it's, it's an area where Jacob's well was built, in an area called Sychar, a holy place. It was the place where Jacob built an altar to God. It was a place where Joseph was buried, and it was at 12 noon when Jesus decided to take this trip with his disciples, and he became tired on his trek. Now, remember, Jesus is both 100% God and 100% man, but the humanity of Jesus became tired. So he sat by a well, and he waits, because in his omniscience, he knows that there is a woman in Samaria that needs some attention. There is a woman in Samaria, Linda, that God had been dispatched to to make an example to the rest of the world. There was a woman in Samaria that he knew that we would preach about in 2020 in San Antonio. We didn't know it. We weren't even considered yet, but God knew that he was going to use this story at a time like this. Uh, there, there's great hatred between the Samaritans and the Jews because let me give you a quick overview. The, the Samaritans were considered half-breeds, not full Jews. So we don't deal with them over there. We don't, we don't go over there to that part of town. I gave you three things that we need to consider today. Let me give you three. 
First of all, let me give you the confrontation. The confrontation. When we go through Samaria, we must be prepared to encounter people who don't hold our personal or collective views and values. You know how it is. You Mama make potato salad a certain kind of way. There's some people who will make a mustard-based potato salad, and others will make more of a mayonnaise or a Miracle Whip kind of potato salad. And you'll sit there and you'll say, I like it. It's all right, but it ain't the way my mama make her potato salad. So we, we, we pick and choose where we go and who we hang out with and who we talk to because we don't, we, 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 and by doing that, though, we miss out on the way somebody else do things and view things. Jesus was eager in verse number four. He says, I must needs go through Samaria, that part of the countryside that most people ignore. John 18 says, uh, 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 the reason I was born, I came into the world is to testify of the truth. That's why I'm going to Samaria. I didn't come just to testify to the truth to your neighborhood, people who look just like you only. I came that the whole world might be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him. And listen, people in Samaria include the whosoever. The people over by the AT&T Center includes the whosoever. The people who the police put their knee on the neck of black men and kill them are part of the whosoever. And even the police are part of the whosoever. Jesus was warned. He demonstrated his humanity by sitting down at the well and waiting. It's no coincidence. Listen, God is God. He knows that where you and I are going to be from day to day, from moment to moment. Jesus was waiting, I tell you. He had moved time and eternity to meet this woman at the well. This woman was coming his way, and he was patiently waiting to rescue this one lost sheep. Normally, the women in the village would gather early in the morning while it was still cool, and they'd go and get together, and they would catch up at the well on, on the talk of the day and fellowship with one another. The talk of the day. You know the talk of the day. You know. You know her. You know those shoes she had on. You know that dress she wore. Can you believe, you know, the talk of the day? That's another way for gossip. But this woman, she shows up alone, and she didn't show up in the cool of the day. She shows up in the hot part of the day. Why? It's likely because she lived over there in Samaria. And even within Samaria, there are people in Samaria who don't want to deal with other people. Listen, we got, a, we got a lot of work to do, church. That's saying that even rich, wealthy, affluent people have people that are rich and affluent, and they don't deal with them. There are poor people who don't deal with other poor people. We, we're all messed up. We need the grace of God, the mercy of God, to remind us from whence we came. We are all saved by grace. We've all messed up. We all need Jesus. And we act like... We have the nerve, the audacity to look down our nose at other people as though they are less than. If it had not been for God, there go us. I can't believe, I can't believe, I can't believe Pastor let that, him come in here. He got a record. I heard he spent time. We should all spend time. Truth be told, yes, we all got a past. But they don't want to deal with this woman, this, this woman, this, this particular Samaritan. Because alone, she is an outcast among outcasts. Uh, 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 she probably went in the heat of the day to avoid insults. Other women talking about her, despise her, looking at her up and down, snickering behind her back, and maybe even telling her to her face. Girl, I can't believe. I'm telling you, church, we must go through Samaria. Secondly, 
Not only is there a confrontation, but look at the conversation. Verses 9 and following. Here Jesus breaks several barriers for you and for me and for this woman. In the life of this woman and the entire Samaritan people, he teaches us a modern-day lesson of talking with people who are different from us. In the midst of a Greek and Roman and Jewish cultures which viewed women almost on the level of possessions, you say, I can't believe they treated women like that. Well, just long, not long ago, African Americans were treated the same way as chattel property, as, as, as property, as three-fifths of a man. I'm telling you, African American slaves in this country, we have a bad history of treating people less than, looking down on somebody else, not loving them for who God created them to be, less than living over there in Samaria. That's why we don't go over there, because I don't associate with them over there, because I have decided in my heart they are less than, they are not as important as. And then you have to ask yourself if that's how you feel about them, where is your heart and have you truly been redeemed? Has God really changed your heart? Are you Christian in title only? Or has God really redeemed you? If so, you need to go to Samaria on the west side. Samaria on the south side. Samaria on the east side. Samaria on the north side. Samaria in the penthouse buildings. Samaria in those high-rise business buildings. Samaria down on the street where nobody has any, any housing at all. Samaria, the places where you and I don't normally go. Normally, rabbis, Jewish rabbis, didn't teach the women. But Jesus decided to include this woman in this story because he knew, he knew it would be preached one day. Jesus talks to a woman. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask for a drink from me? a woman of Samaria. Jesus shattered the cultural condition by offering his teaching freely to anyone who would listen, whether they were men or women. Jesus did that pretty regularly, though. Remember Anna in the temple in Luke chapter 2? Don't forget the woman who washed the Savior's feet in Luke chapter 7. How about the woman with the issue of blood in Matthew chapter number 9? Jesus, I tell you, was a revolutionary. He was protesting. He was marching, if you will, through Samaria. He was protesting against the establishment. He was protesting against the status quo. His actions caused surprising reactions to his social group in all areas of his life. When is the last time you've had an individual protest? You can do it. Let me tell you how. I was at a restaurant with my wife, with Linda, uh, a few weeks ago, and I'm ordering a takeout meal because they weren't serving in the restaurant or they were very limited. And I'm placing my order with the young girl behind the counter. A white woman to my side was complaining that her order wasn't correct, so the manager, the white manager, came over to correct it. While I'm placing my order, the white manager steps in front of me and, and, and doesn't say, excuse me, sir, I'll be right with you, but let me handle this first. He just starts talking to the woman that I was talking to behind the counter and telling her to get the order correct. And then he walks away. I wanted to, in my flesh, grab him and say, dude, do you know who you just did? Do you realize how disrespectful that is? You just disrespected me, a black man, spending my money at this restaurant to make sure a white woman was happy. 
I'm not teaching y'all to hate white people. I'm saying this is what it looks like in real everyday life on a regular basis. I stepped back because two things. One, I was hungry and it was too late to go anywhere else. I had to pray, God, help me not go off and look like an angry black man because then I wouldn't get any service. And two, they would probably call the police. Disrespectful. Let me say this. It's not enough just to not be racist, but it's, you need to step up and call racism when you see it. My brothers and my sisters, especially my white brothers and sisters, when you see racism occurring on the job, during promotions, in the schools, at the bank, in the restaurants, at the grocery store, and you see somebody of color being disrespected and they feel, this, they feel unable to defend themselves, you step up and say, no, 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 he was next. Take care of him first. That's how you can do it. Call it out for what it is. I'm telling you, Jesus was revolutionary. And at this particular point, he didn't have a whole crowd of thousands following him to get this done. He was revolutionary one person at a time, talking to people that nobody else would talk to. Are you ready to talk to somebody who's different from you? Don't dress like you. Don't speak like you. Don't go to the places you go to. Secondly, Jesus talked about salvation. These are my sub points. He talked about, he talked to a woman. He talked about salvation. He answered her in verse number 10. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. When we take the detours of life and go through unfamiliar locales. We open up our mouths and we share the gospel and, our, and, 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 and not our preferences or our likes or our opinions. Listen, we miss out when we don't go places that are different from where we used to go. Listen, you miss out if you don't go over the east side and go to Mrs. Kitchens and get some of her fried chicken. You miss out if you don't go to Lockhart and get some of that sausage. You miss out If you don't go down W.W. White Road and catch Mr. and Mrs. G's, you miss out. If you don't go to some of these places where you can get some good eating and some good fellowship and good friendship, you miss out. If you don't go down to Poteet to the Strawberry Festival, you miss out. I'm trying to tell you, sometimes we got to go to places we're not accustomed to going. Otherwise, we miss out on the riches of life and how people do things differently from us. Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's, 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 he's talking to the woman about salvation. He's, uh, uh, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation. Not just for your side of the tracks, but for the other side too. In Jerusalem and in Samaria, it's the power of God for the Jews first and then to the Greeks. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It saves the the rich and the poor, the black and the white, the Asians and the Latinos. It saves everybody. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He is telling her about salvation. When we go to our Samaria, police brutality, racial discrimination, white fragility, hate, and prejudice will never change through legislation alone or riots or killings. Only the gospel can do that. Jeremiah 2.13 says it like this, For my people have committed two evils. One, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, which is what Jesus was offering this woman. And two, They have hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. A cistern really is just like a water tower that you and I see in the city of San Antonio that holds water. But the cisterns were in the ground, and it captured rainwater. 
And in the times of drought, you can pull water out of those cisterns. But what he's saying is, instead of depending on me, the living water, y'all have tried to find salvation in some other place. And your cisterns got holes in it. So when water gets captured, it leaks and goes straight down into the ground because you're trying to find your own way to salvation. You can't get there without Christ. Jesus talks thirdly about sin, verses 16 and following. He said to her, now, go and uh, do something, sweetheart. Go call your husband to come here. Verse 17, the woman answered, I, 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 I don't have a husband. And Jesus said to her before she could finish, he says, you're right in saying, I don't have a husband. Verse 18, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you say is true, Jesus says. He's now calling out her sin. Why well, sin? I, I, I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. And some of y'all say, ah, oh, here you go, Reverend, here you go. You were doing okay, now you're messing, now you're messing around. Now you're talking about sin. We all have sin. Let me say it like this. If we don't admit that we have sin that we need to be saved from, it's like a, it's like a drowning man or woman who don't realize they're drowning. You can't be saved if you don't realize you're drowning. Years ago, Linda and I went snorkeling. And I was going to let the, the buoyancy of the water keep me up so when we decided to jump in off the boat into the water, I was just going to float with my snorkel on, and I was just going to snorkel in the ocean, and I told Linda to put on her life vest up. And I said, now, baby, when you jump off the edge of the boat, this is what's going to happen. Immediately, because of gravity, it's going to take you under, but you're going to come right back up, and the life vest, the buoyancy of the life vest is going to keep you on top of the surface but I'll be right here in case you need me. Well, here I am with my arrogant self. I get into the water without my life vest. I jump in. I come back up. I'm floating. Linda jumps in. She comes back up, and she immediately is looking for me. She, and she grabs onto me, but her weight and the water pulls me under. So I'm saying, wait, get up off me. And I turn to the guy in the boat, <laughs> and I said, Give me my life vest. Give me my life vest because I'm drowning. You, it takes a smart man to realize when you're drowning. I'm going to drown. You don't hear me, Marcel. I'm going under, bro. And she's going to be floating away saying, I loved him so much. He was such a wonderful guy. Now, give me my life vest. <laughs> That's what Jesus is teaching here in this text. You need to know when you need to be rescued. You need a life vest. He's teaching about sin. We can't be rescued if we don't know we have sin in our lives. We need to be awakened to our spiritual need. We must confront our sin. Listen, we, we, we need to point people to Jesus. And Jesus pointed her out her sinfulness. Scripture says this, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. For though your sins are like scarlet, in other words, they're like red, they're blood colored. They will be white as snow, they, though they are red like crimson. They shall be like wool in Isaiah 1.18. Jesus, God, invites us to talk it over with him. And he promises an outcome of salvation. In Acts, the book of Acts, the apostle Paul talks to the jailer who had him and Silas in jail and, and shared the gospel in such a way that when they finished sharing the gospel, they had to give up some of their idols, some of their old ways of thinking, some of their racial ways of thinking, some of their idols that they, had, they needed to put aside. And they had to ask Jesus, ask the disciples rather, what must we do to be saved, to get this salvation that you're talking about? I'm telling you, people's hearts have to be changed. They have to be converted so that they can live in a world and, and affect culture for the best. I believe one of the reasons why we don't 
prefer the world, listen, the world, not the church, why the world, and some, some people who are nominal creatures, you know what a nominal Christian is. A nominal Christian is a person who, ah, they may go through the motions of Christianity, but they really haven't let the word change their hearts. Nominal Christians and unsaved people, we prefer rather than to love people and to try to get the Lord, the, the, the gospel to change them, we prefer to fuss and cuss about the situation. We turn on, I can't believe those people are acting like that. What if they do that the police are after them? They must have done something if the police are doing something. Now, see, you don't understand. You haven't walked in my shoes. You haven't even got to know me. You don't understand that oftentimes the police will pull you over just because you are of a different hue. Just because. They want to know why you drive in that kind of car. They want to know why are you in this particular neighborhood. I ain't committed no crime. There is no uh, all points bulletin out for an African-American six foot tall black man with brown eyes and black hair out for anything. You just pull him over just because. And then when you pull me over, you want to snatch me out and treat me unhuman. No, 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 no. And, and so our answer, our solution is to fuss and cuss. Because uh, it's our way, because if we give up fussing and cussing, we lose control over the narrative. But when we submit ourselves to God and God says to share the gospel and to love people who seem unlovable, we don't like that approach. Because, see, the first approach puts me in charge because I can do with you as I please. But when I let God into the scenario, into the narrative, I have to step back and love the unlovable, care for those who I normally would rather arrest and choke and handcuff. We try to put ourselves in the place of God, and that's where God has to arrest us. Let me tell you, to those of you who may be watching this streaming and you don't agree with me, God bless you. I'm praying for you, seriously. You need to let God change your heart, transform your heart. And stop trying to make people act the way you want them to act. Only the gospel can do that. Yeah. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, a person asks Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? The answer was given, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And then that's not enough because you can say you love me. But he gives them a second part. Love your neighbor as yourself. See, loving God, we can do that. We, I, I love God. I go to the church. I sing the songs. I worship. I read the scripture. And you can tell me you love God. But if you don't carry out the second part, you can't love God if you treat me poorly. It says to love your neighbor as you do yourself. In other words, I'm going to give my neighbor the benefit of the doubt. I'm not going to just pull him or her over because they are of a different color. This requires us to love people who live in Samaria, to tolerate people who live in Samaria, to try to understand people to go, who live in Samaria. Fourthly, Jesus talks about worship. The woman shifts the conversation from sin to worship. She says, it's in your Bible too. She says, well, you know, my people, verse 20 and 24, they worship over here. The Jews worship over there. Jesus says, there's coming a day, sweetheart, where it don't matter where you worship, but who you worship. Ah, there it is right there. Jesus ignores her trick and tells her that true worship is not a place. It's a person. Rituals are thrown out the window. Yeah, we must live it out. The way we treat people is different from us. John 13 tells us to love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. You can't put your foot on the neck of somebody and love them at the same time. You can't, as a senator or congressman or congresswoman, say that you love God and fail to it, uh, 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 implement uh, uh, justice 
when justice needs to be passed. You can't say there's no indictment against a police officer just because they're a police officer. And let me say this. We got to stop moving police from one city to the next city. They still got sin in their lives. They still got criminality in their lives. We, we got to stop giving them cover. We've complained for years against the Catholic Church saying that y'all are just hiding these priests who are pedophiles. Well, guess what? We're hiding cops who are killers. Not all cops, but a few bad ones make the whole group look bad. There's the confrontation. There's the conversation. And lastly, there's the conversion. Thank God there's conversion. Verses 27 to 24 and following. 24 says this, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And, and the woman said to him, I, I know, I know the Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, I, I, I am he. The Christ that you're talking about is the one sitting here at the well talking to you at noonday hour. I the one sitting here asking you to give me some physical water. I'm trying to give you some living water. I, the one you're waiting on, I've been waiting on you. I, the living water, is sitting right in front of you. I am talking to you when nobody else would talk to you. When the women showed up in the cool of the day and wouldn't talk to you, I showed up in the heat of the day and I'm talking to you. Let me tell you, y'all, God, through Jesus Christ, shows up in the heat of battle, in the heat of the day, when people put their foot on our necks or shoot us when we're in our beds or have two people run us down with pickup trucks. God says, I'm still there. I haven't forgotten. Actually, what I'm doing, y'all don't understand all my moves right now, but I'm moving everything for my glory and for your good. And I'm moving in such a way that not only is the community, but our nation and the whole world saw a man's life snuffed out while he cried out for his mama. He says, but I'm still in the midst of all that because I'm using George Floyd's life and Ahmaud Arbery's life and Breonna's life and the lives before them and since them just in the last few days. The last few days, we've seen more brutality from the police. There are some evil people who are hiding behind the badges of policing that gives them a license to kill. And, and because historically they haven't been called to account, they feel like they can still get away with it. But the day is coming where God is going to put an end to it. Listen, there's going to be a hot special place in hell for those who kill people with impunity and for those who fail to speak up. You can't be a black man or a white man, or yellow man or a red man. You can't be a person in this country and stay quiet when iniquity is going on like it is. When people kill the way they're doing right now with cameras right in their face, and you stay quiet, you are basically saying, I don't care. I'm tired. I'm telling you, it's time for the church to go through Samaria. Notice that when Jesus starts talking to this woman, then verse 27 says, then the disciples came back and they marveled. They were surprised. Wait a minute. He's talking to a woman. And, and no one said anything. Jesus broke some barriers. And said, Here is a rabbi talking to a woman. A Jew talking to a Samaritan. In the heat of the day, a, the, the savior of the world talking to a sinner. Jesus didn't care. Jesus didn't go, I wish somebody would say something. I, I, wish, I wish you would. Because just like I pointed out her sin, I point out yours too. Jesus broke all these barriers. Thank God for barriers. And there, nobody asked. The scripture says, the scripture says, and listen, it's right there, it's right there. It makes you kind of chuckle. It, the scripture says, no one asked him, why are you talking with her? Why are you talking to her? So the woman left 
whole water and went away to the town to the people. It was incredible. As soon as Jesus revealed, re, uh, revealed himself to her, she responded in faith. And salvation came to this woman instantaneously. She accepted Jesus Christ on his terms, understanding her past and his presence, her sin, and his salvation. Salvation is the total work of God. He seeks to rescue you and me from doom and the power of sin and to bestow upon us the blessing of grace. Somebody say grace. Grace, grace that, un that encompassing eternal life. So much so, she was so happy. Listen, I, I understand. I understand the woman. I do. When I came back to the church at age 27, and I found out that I too have been saved by grace through faith and not because of my knucklehead mistakes of the past. I cried like a baby, and I ain't been quiet since. And that's been back in 1987. She ran off with excitement. Forgot all about her water pot. That's like you and I going to the grocery store to get groceries and we show up at Walmart or H-E-B and we forgot why we went into the store. Now, some of us show up and leave out because we forgot why we went in because we're getting older. But she was so excited about the good news that she found out. She ran and she went to tell others about the good news. She went to tell others, baby, I went in for physical water. And she says, uh, she, uh, she was also impelled. She ran to the city to tell others. She, she ran to tell others, come see the man who told me all about myself. And notice, she went to the men of the city. Whoa, er, pump the brakes. Wait a minute. Why did she go to the men? She already got a reputation, and the brothers see her running to them, and they probably sitting there like, here she come. Yeah, she come to see me again. No, no, no. She come to see you for a different reason, bro. It ain't, like it, it ain't like it used to be. I think she went to the men instead of the women because the men knew her best. And the men saw the transformation. She came to the men, ran to the men, but she ain't making no deal with them. She telling them, she testifying now. Y'all need to come see a man who told me all about myself and still loved me. Not because of what I gave them, but because of what he gave me. He gave me living water. And people, the scripture goes on to say, and the citizens of that town came to hear Jesus and they were saved. When is the last time you ran and told somebody? I'm telling you, some strange things can happen in Samaria if you go there. There's some salvation to be had if you go to Samaria. Salvation will give you a message to share and a heart to share it. In spite of racial discrimination, in spite of politicians who turn a blind eye to the hurt, in spite of the sorrow of our nation right now, I believe that God still uses people over there in Samaria. I believe my brother George Floyd lived in Samaria. You know, Samaria, that part of the town that most people don't go to in Minneapolis, Samaria. Samaria where you don't have the high-end department stores. Samaria, where you don't have the luxury cars driving around. Samaria, the places where you can't go to that hole in the wall and get that good home cooking. Samaria, over there. I, I believe that the Samaritan is an instrument to use, be used by the Lord, that many may come to know Jesus Christ based on our convictions. 2 Corinthians 4 says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, let me encourage you, church, don't give up. Tell your neighbor next to you, neighbor, don't quit. Neighbor, don't give up. He says in 2 Corinthians 4, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Listen, church, we are called to go through Samaria to do something hard, not something easy. See, it's easy 
to just get together and put our arms around each other and sing kumbaya and, and have a, a joint worship service. But then after tolerating each other for two hours, we go back to our respective parts of town and we don't deal with each other anymore. We are, are not merely to have combined worship service, but we are called to do something much more difficult, to meet with them, converse with them, spend time with them, share the gospel with them, become brothers and sisters with them, make disciples for Christ. And that means it takes time. How does it take time? You don't teach algebra in one day. If a teacher takes a whole semester to teach algebra, what do we think it will take? Why do we think it will take only one time to share the gospel? No, we have to go to Samaria and keep going back to Samaria. We got to keep living the comfort of our homes and go to those streets that we're not comfortable going to. We got to go to those areas that we're not comfortable going to. Go to that part of town we're not comfortable going to. Church, I'm telling you, we must go through Samaria. God has shown us by example through Jesus Christ. There's a love for himself and a love for his people that we go through Samaria. Not because we all that, but because of his redeeming grace because of his love over our lives, because of what he has done for us. Time out. I'm tired. I'm tired, I tell you. I'm tired of hearing the stories day after day. And then I'm tired of us moving the cameras from the riots and the destruction. I'm tired of the continued brutality. And then we pan the cameras from there to those who we expect to get answers from, and they're sitting over there saying, uh, this is not the time. Well, let's pan the pictures to the church. Church, it's time for us to go through Samaria. It's time for us to keep going back to Samaria. I know you don't want to go over by AT&T Center because it's not in your area of influence. It's not in your area where people look like you, dress like you, drive cars like you, live in houses like you. But guess what? There is work to be done in Samaria. And Samaria is not just a poor area of town. Sometimes the poverty is in the high-rise buildings where the rich people live. They are rich in physical wealth, but they are poor in spiritual health. They need Jesus too. You and I need to turn and call sin out for what it is. And let me encourage you, my brothers and my sisters, sometimes Samaria will come to you at the cash register when somebody abuses you and steps in front of you. We need to call it out for what it is. You stepped in front of me. I was next, but I'm going to let you go. I was next, but I'm going to let you have it. Sometimes Samaria are those people who mistrust us in public, misuse us in public, and we got to let them know because of the love of Christ, I'm going to love you. I'm going to pray for you even though you meant it evil for me. God meant it for good even though you meant it for evil. Church, it's time for us to go through Samaria. Somebody give God praise in the house. I'm tired of us doing it the same old way. We can't keep doing it the same way and expect a different result. God has given the church the tools, the power, and the responsibility to change the world. I have to agree with the Apostle Paul who says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the gospel, not me, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. But we can't leave it at just sharing the gospel and then driving to our other part of town. Because in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, we are called to make disciples, to, to, uh, to, to provide counseling and ongoing teaching 
And it's not a one-time, one-shot wonder. It's not like you go to the doctor's office and they give you an antibiotic. And they say, take this three times for three days and you'll be cured. No, that discipleship means taking somebody under your wing, walking with them, talking with them, understanding them, loving them, caring about them, caring for them. When we learn to stop trying to use simple solutions to complex issues, then we become more like Christ. Listen, if you're still streaming us this morning, let me give you some tools. I want to share the plan of salvation with you. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, let me give you five things you can take home with you today. One, grace. Heaven is a free gift. It's free. It's absolutely free. God loves you. And salvation is free. But you don't deserve it and you can't earn it because of number two, sin. Like that woman at the well, we all have sin in our lives. God loves you, but he don't love the stuff that you say, the stuff that you do, the stuff that you think. So what are we going to do? Well, number three, God provided that bridge, that sky bridge, if you will, that connection that connects his grace and his love with sinners. Ah, he loves you, but he can't tolerate our sins. He connected us with number four through Jesus Christ. Who is Christ and what did he do? He's the infinite God-man. He needed to be fully God because he needed to pay for our sins, but he needed to be man because through man, one sin entered the world, and through one man, sin is taken out of the world. So he came and he took our sins on the cross, on the cross for himself. And he became sin for us. And he died for you. And he died for me. But more than that, three days later, he got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. And the way you finally accept Christ is not only by grace, not only by acknowledging your sin, not only by realizing that God loves us but don't love like our sins, uh, and, 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 and understanding that Jesus paid the price, but trust in him. Number five, faith. Faith, trusting in Jesus Christ alone. There's no other way to get to heaven except through Christ. Listen, you, and, and don't, don't try to add to it. It's not faith in Christ and trying to make up for all the bad you've done. So, Reverend, why should I live a good life then? Why should I be kind? Why should I go to church? Why should I read my Bible? Why should I change? One person said it like this. The rest of my life is just a PS, a postscript, to say thank you to God for saving me and doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. It's like going to that brain surgeon that removes the tumor. Yeah, you're going to pay a bill for the, sur sur for, for the surgery, but you turn around and you tell the doctor, doctor, thank you. I went to a lot of specialists, but you're the one who were able to find it and get it out. Thank you for using your gifts to get it out. Listen, church, I, and those who are streaming, make that decision today. And if you just made that decision, do us a favor. Write to Skybridge Church at www.skybridgechurch.org or, or, or email us at skybridgechurch at gmail.com and tell us the decision you just made. Maybe you just made the decision to come back to church or to rededicate yourself to Jesus Christ. Or maybe you saw yourself in the story today and you realize that you need to swallow some pride and realize that we all need to go to Samaria and be different. If that's you, send us a letter or an email and text us and let us know decisions you made today. And we'll give God praise and we'll pray for you. Let me give us some announcements before we go home today. Don't forget, our youth ministry is having their Zoom meeting on Thursdays at 7.30, all of our youth. Our Bridge Kids Zoom is on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Wednesday at 7 p.m. Our youth, Thursdays at 7.30. Our Bridge Kids, Wednesdays at 7. Our men's ministry will be meeting Tuesday. Tuesday, brothers, brothers. 
This Tuesday, 7.30, we start fasting together, brothers. Don't forget, the men start fasting on this Tuesday for 14 days, for two weeks. Y'all going to be giving up something, but you're going to get something in return for two weeks. Also, don't forget about our Jericho Walk. This is part of our outreach ministry where we're going to go to Heritage Nursing Home and Rehab Center down the road. Why? Because there are some people in Samaria that need to see the church in action. Now, we can't go inside of the nursing home, but we're going to go around the perimeter, the outside of the nursing home, and we're going to sing, and we're going to hold up posters, and we're going to press our hands up against the window and let the people in the nursing home know that we love them and we're thinking about them. And we're not just waiting for Christmas to come back to the nursing home and show love. It's Saturday, June the 27th at 10 a.m. I need to see brothers. Don't sit there and let, the, let the, just the women and the kids show up. Brothers, brothers, don't make me come to y'all house. I ain't scared of y'all. Brothers and sisters, June 27th, 10 a.m., Come on out. And we got a birthday this week. One birthday this week. Willie Jackson. Willie Jackson. Willie getting old. I think Willie 29, 28, 29, maybe 30. Happy birthday, Will. God bless you. As we get ready to go, let's stand, get ready to go home. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, audio team. Uh, we got some special people helping Brother Paul up in the audio, the Stevens uh, family. We got... Darnell and Labrika up there. I think they already turned me off. Yeah, Brika pushed a button. Yeah, she turned she turned yeah, she turned me off probably when I first stood up to come preach. And uh we're we're yeah, we, I see where you are. Uh, Gaddy is back with us. Good to see you in the house. Uh-huh. And brother Giles, I found out brother Giles is radical. And uh, he, his mama told me, too, uh, yeah, he, he radical. He getting ready to get, get and connect with me for our evangelism training. Good to see you brothers in the house. Minister Hardeman, thank you, my brother, for leading us in worship and in prayer. We can't do this without prayer. It's the prayer of God. And y'all don't know this. Y'all don't know this, but he comes in and prays with me in my office every Sunday before I come out. And he helps ease my spirit and my heart, especially when I'm feeling kind of In a, in, a, in a zone, Sister Benita. Can I say it like that? Special prayer for the Johnson family. We understand that Brother Robert Johnson and Sister Benita, Brother Celeste and Sister Dante had a loss in their family. Their, their, their aunt in Houston passed. So our prayers are with you guys. It's been a mean season. It's been a mean season. The Robinsons have seen family go home. His brother, uncles, and aunts on both sides of the family. And, 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 and in addition to all this going on, y'all, so keep one another in prayer, check on each other, care for each other, and uh, we'll get through this as a family. Amen? Uh, uh, it, it takes a village, but be careful who's in your village. That's another sermon. That's another sermon. Let's pray together. Father, we bless your name, and we thank you so much for who you are and for how you have seen us from one day to the next. Oh, God, I pray that we did some justice to this text. And, and that you got glory and people were helped as we walk through these difficult days of, of tension in our nation. Lord, I pray that you help us understand that we have to change. And we have to be willing to go through Samaria. Go through those, go to those people who, who, who don't want to talk to us, be around us, hang out with us. Uh, 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 engage us, love us. We all got to go through a Samaria in our lives. Maybe it's the Samaria on our jobs. Maybe it's the Samaria across town. Maybe it's the Samaria in, in our own households. But Lord, we all have a Samaria that we have to deal with. And I pray that this text, dear God, brought you glory and strengthened our walk and our commitment to the Christian faith. Now, as we lift our hands for the last time in the sanctuary today, to you, O oh God, who are able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before your glorious presence with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. We love you, O oh God. We praise you and we give you thanks. In the name of Jesus the Christ, 
we pray. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. God bless you. Bless you, man. Bless you.